Uh, in the opening remarks by the trade minister, uh, one of the things he talked about was uh, regulation and how uh, it will be imposed. He's quite certain about that. I'd like to get your viewpoints on that. Peter. I think that that's one of the challenges that the industry faces is this idea that we're going to get patchwork, uh, air, patchwork type of regulation. And that's very hard for ship owners. We've already seen it with the uh, the way we have to burn low sulfur fuel when we come into European ports and in certain other ports. Uh, I think that, that will drive up the cost of the industry. And uh, there's a lot of people who are advocating against it, having one worldwide uh, type of si situation. But right now, uh, I have to say that uh, shipping doesn't have uh, effective advocates for it. But I just want to point out that shipping remains the most efficient form of moving goods and we only account for 2.7% of all the emissions in the world. But I think we still can be better. And I was very happy, Peter, when you said earlier that uh, your main operational issue now is to reduce fuel consumption. And I think there is an, that's an area where we actually can cooperate much closer and by that create better results, yeah. both for you financially, but also for the environment. Mm -hmm. Or this costs you money or does it save you money? <laughs> <laughs> I think when Peter is uh, focused on kind of reducing fuel consumption, it's not because it's particularly environmental friendly, but be because it's uh, into the money thing. And I think that's as long as it goes hand in hand, it's go probably hand better. Hand. <laughs> but I think that's actually the beauty of it. <laughs> kind of saving fuel and, uh, and saving cost is here. Kind of it's just enforcing each other. But I'm actually a bit surprised that so few uh, ship owners are really understanding what's the big benefit of, of uh, doing something seriously here, and especially on energy management. It's a lot of talks about new designs, and I'm sure if you go around an expedition, it, uh, you will actually find that you can save 200% uh, of your fuel just by buying new bits and pieces. But actually, to optimize what you already have through energy management, it's a great potential, and it's kind of... I anticipate that around 10% we can actually do with easy measures um, uh, among the ship owners. Yeah, but, but the uh, industry uh, is already doing that. Yeah. Both uh, uh, frontline and, and yeah, TKO. Yeah, but some are, but it, 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 a lot of our ship owners are not. I think the best thing you can do for the tanker market is that all tanker and owners come together and decide that we're going to support the green case and we're going to slow steam the vessel with 30%. It has a certain effect on CO2, which is very, very, very good. And secondly, it has a fantastic effect on the freight rates. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but the, whole, the whole question is what the industry standardizes itself on. Are we still going to run at 14, 15 knots, or are we going to run at 12 knots, make more money in the same way that you see the container industry slowing itself down? Uh, I, if you I do actually it, you get the European Union coming to check your files. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> But you and I will be at Hans Christian's Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> well, wh what's the most likely scenario going forward in terms of what you just raised? I'm not sure. That's why we have to stay flexible. Uh, I, I think some sort of regulation is going to come, and shipping has to get out in front of it. The, the easiest way, the, it basically comes down to two things. Are you going to put in this whole regulatory framework of actually measuring emissions, or are you just going to figure out that if you, if you tax the... Uh, the fuels like fuel oil as opposed to more environmentally friendly fuels, that's the easiest way to do it. That will not result in much regulation, it will not result in much administrative cost, and that's the simplest way to do it. Because basically if you use more fuel, you have to pay more. If you, use, if you burn more dirty fuel, you have to pay more. It's the simplest way to do it. So you favor a fuel tax, that would be the Absolutely, simplest way to do it. Over, over emissions trading. Yep. I support that very much. I think it's far too easy to create this monster that is not really possible to administer it. And uh, we have to find these easy mechanisms that actually will work for a very diversified industry. There again, I think cooperating closer also with the supply industry, I think, can help. And uh, I encourage you to stop by Jotun down here later today. <laughs> and uh, we have a couple of good solutions for you. Yeah. How do you think, though, that the industry can have a better di a dialogue with regulators to make sure that they are part of the solution as opposed to having to be imposed upon? Um, I, think, I think the whole industry has to be out there. Uh, Graham Westgarth, who runs our technical side, he's, a, he's the chairman of Intertanko, uh, and every single group uh, has to participate. Bergeson has done a lot in, in promoting that as, as well. We just have to keep advocating for our, ourselves. But we aren't our best friend because we're sometimes in, in registries and countries where there isn't an effective mechanism. Okay.
Yeah. Well, I think this global coordination is just crucial, and uh, it's to uh, those of us that re really do have the competence and resources really need to participate in, in like InterTACO, like ICS, and we need to make sure that we kind of speak with one voice. I think it's too many voices out there, too many people trying to kind of make this too, too difficult and too complicated. Sure. What do you favor in terms of regulation that's coming? So if it has to happen... Mm. Uh, for once, I probably agree with Peter. Kind of fuel tax is probably the easiest. <laughs> yeah, fuel tax is easiest. You know, one of the things you talked about, Peter, you, you brought up there were some possibilities in the future in terms of technology designs. You're looking at the offshore uh, market. Where do you think the uh, biggest changes in technology will come in the next five to 15 years? I think the biggest change is going to come in hull design. I think that's where uh, Uton is helping in terms of their paints. And a lot of people are spending a lot of time on the actual size and how we make these keels more efficient. They were, they were sized up for worldwide trading, and I think you're going to come into more niches where people are going to size things up in order to save money. And as I was saying, since voyage costs are now much more than the capital costs throughout the life cycle, uh, economics is going to drive that. And are you making the assumption that that will continue to be the case, that voyage costs will be more than the actual? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think DNV in Norway have done a quite a good job thinking about the future of the ships, uh, actually. And, and they've, a lot of it is back to what we talked about, gas. Gas is cheap compared to oil. And from that point of view, if you can get ships to go on gas, it's less emission and it's cheaper energy. Uh, they also have some ideas about not traveling around the whole world with ballast water, which is kind of a waste of energy transformation. I think ideas like that need to be picked up on, and I think we've probably been too slow. I think the biggest shift actually will be uh, using LNG as fuel and then the, the gas-fueled engines. Uh, I, I do agree that with the technology we've got available now, we can optimize the hull a lot, and it's a big potential there as well. But in terms of kind of the real technology, I think it's on the engine side and, and LNG as fuel. But LNG as fuel is a decade away in terms of uh, having a... It's going to be interesting how fast it's going to develop. In terms of having a measurable effect. But what We're about starting now with trucks in China where they effectively have 550 kilometer uh, uh, range and where we effectively fire trucks on LNG, small little LNG plants. And I think it's, it's going to change the industry quicker than you think, I think because so it's well. driven by economy. So I think at least if you're going to do it, you can start with the VLCCs. It's pretty yeah. easy trading patterns. Yes. Yeah. If you want to supply the fuel at certain points, that's but we have enough VLCC, Peter, remember that. <laughs> 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 Who's going to pay for the infrastructure for LNG? Um, Especially if you want to go out longer distances. Ultimately, the customers, we have an LNG that was built on slow diesel. Uh, we're now going to redo it back to dual fuel diesel electric. It's probably going to cost us $25 million to pay back as a year and a half which only goes to your point, which is that it's the propulsion. So um, people are making the investment because the payback in terms of using gas as fuel rather than diesel uh, pays for itself uh, immediately. It's just the BTU content. Since oil is 20 times what gas costs, on a, whereas it's only eight times in terms of its uh, energy effect, people are, are going to move to gas, but it'll be in a measured way. But I think you're, of course, right. It will take some time because we have a big existing fleet. But then, uh, and to that fleet, I think it's uh, abatement technology, emission abatement technology. It's going to be really interesting to see if they can come up or we can come up with some solution that can work without kind of putting a chemical plant on board our vessels. Okay. 